Hello, good day, and welcome back. So today, this is the first section in chapter four. And again, from the introduction to chapter four, we're gonna be sort of looking at how you can break up large application. And the reason we're doing that is to try and understand how different the type of tools and what kind of feature the language give you in terms of abstracting the different parts of your application. And that is also gonna inform us a little bit about what kind of features goes into the core of the language that you don't need any libraries for, and what goes into libraries, whether they be standard libraries that the language define, or just extension library that might come from the community or come after. All right, so to help us do this, we're gonna assume that we have this application. And it's a very simple application. And basically the application is gonna gather some user input to drive the application, connect to some sort of SQL database or remote server or something of that sort, do some comput computation with the data, and then write it out to file storage, and then of course clean up. And the only reason why we're gonna write it out like this is because I wanna show you that if you have an application that's doing this, something like this, how you can break it up. So this is one way of already breaking it up, but we'll see some more detail of what I mean. So let's assume that oh no, you, we understand that since we have to get input from the user, that maybe that's something we may wanna abstract to some sort of module that's gonna handle user interface, right? So UI, the user interface. The other thing you might wanna do is break up along storage because we know how we're gonna be getting things from some remote machine. We can think of this as information stored remotely. We wanna write stuff locally, and that's again storage. The complex computation, we might put it in a complex module. And then we might have a module called common or core or something like that for all the stuff that ties this all together, right? And so that's so one way, but it's not the only way of breaking up our application. And like I said before, even when you break it up at a high level along those four modules, you might still want to dig deeper and say each module is further broken down. And the user interface could be graphical or it could be text-based. And then regardless of if it's text-based or graphical, we might need to do different things on different operating system. We might need to do different things on Windows or Mac or Linux. On, on the storage, was file storage and was like stored on the network or something like that. All right. So what, how does Seep um, allows you to abstract these ideas and reuse some of this code? Because you can imagine, what if somebody um, on your team was assigned the task of working on the UI and now you have to pull in their core or your company already had a UI library? Um, how might that have been written so you can just pull it into your application? So in C, you know that how you have source file, we've been talking about that C files, but we'll, and we've seen that how you can do include of that H files, but you can write those that H files also. So you can also create your own that H file, and those are usually where you're gonna put declarations. And in C, there's a, and C++, there's a big distinction between declaration and definition. They're very two, two separate things. And you can have as many declarations in C as you like without having an error. You can redeclare something over and over and over and over, and so long as it doesn't allocate storage, that is fine. Now, we're not going to see just how you get away with that in C or C++, because that's beyond the scope of what we're trying to do. We just, I'm just mentioning it. The reason why is because you can see when you declare certain things, you can put that declaration in that H file, because that H file get included by that C files and other that H files. So that's why, because some other files include other, other files that for including not other files, so then the same other file get included multiple times. I will see how you try and prevent, you guard against that, but even then the declaration might get pulled in multiple, in multiple places. All right, so those that's at the source level. So all C really has is that C files, that H files, those are kind of source files, and declarations are in usually that H files, and that C file would have hidden declarations that you won't want to expose, and there are tricks to how you do that so it doesn't get added to the global namespace, but um, and then the definitions are definitely there. You don't want to put definition in that H file because again, that H files get pulled in multiple places. And since you're not really learning about C, just take that at my word and don't worry about it. In terms of once you compile something that you want to be able to reuse, so you can always give somebody source code and they can include it and reuse it. But what's the best way to give them something that, um, like a library? Well, in, in C, you can compile something to an object file. And it's like an intermediate file. It's not, so even if you compile something, an object file on Mac, Intel 64, you cannot have that same object file work on Windows Intel 64, even though it's the same CPU. Um, but the operating system there is different, so that's why you need the same OS and CPU. And so object files are not really interchangeable, so they're not exactly like class files in Java that you could just move around. But there's this, there's this intermediate binary format that does um, include the source code in a platform-dependent manner and um, a position-independent code and what it means is that it's not tied to where it should be located in memory. Now, if all this sounds too much and too far, 
don't worry about it. I'm going to move on, but just say object file is this intermediate format that can be used to combine executables, to pick executables. They also have archives and these are usually .a files and you just take a bunch of object files and you put them in sort of like a zip. Those are, you can ship libraries that way also. Um, there's shared object library, which are usually .so. So they usually in Unix, you'd see a .so file means shared object. And those now you take object file and you made a shared object library and it's a form of executable. It gets loaded by the operating system. It gets loaded into location and memory. And then when you run your code, it's dynamically linked with that. And again, we're not going to go into the details of linking and running code really in the Unix environment or any sort of operating system environment, but that's sort of things that happen. And then of course there's your executable, but I really shouldn't put executable under the same space of reuse because you really don't get to reuse an executable. So really it should be those three object file archives and libraries. Okay. So now that we <laughs> quickly breeze through that, um, let's go look at some code because that's the best way to sort of get a little bit of feel of what's going on. So let's, here's our application and the uh, five things that we want to do in our application. And we're going to say that so we're going to start coding and now we're going to create a .c file, main.c, and we're going to stick um, the outline of our overall application. And of course we got to comment it out. And so at this point we have to actually have something that can run. It can't do anything, but it's runnable code. So let's say we actually want to go ahead and start coding. So we might say, you know what, let's get a user input. So let's write a function to get a user input. And then we're going to say this function hides all the details of what we need to do to get all the input we need in order to run this application. Because as what I said before in C and C++, you need to declare your functions before you use them. That's it's going to tell you how you have implicit declaration. So here we have declared our function on line tree. And now the next thing we're going to do is implement it. So we can jump down to the bottom and say that we're going to implement this function. And implementing it, we're going to do something very simple. We're just going to use a print statement, um, say, oh, we're getting user info. That's it. All right. So that's considered our implementation. So we have our declaration on line three, the usage of our function on line eight, and the definition of our function. I used the word implement just now, but that's the definition of our function. All right. So if we go and open up a terminal and run this, compile it and run it, uh, we'll see that it works. Now we could run it by using our run code, but we have several ways of compiling and running applications. So you can see I run GCC on the main.c, got an executable, run it. I can compile it first and then link it and run it. And I could use GCC to link it. Um, but either way, they all still give me an executable, which I can run. So um, that's just showing you that how, how we would create that object file that I mentioned is just by saying compile. So in C, C++ parlance, um, compiling is different than linking. So compiling is what you get, you do to get that, that O file, which is the object file, which is that position independent code I mentioned that doesn't have any address location in it. And now once you get a bunch of that O file, you can make them, link them into a library, which is sort of like an executable or um, that allows you to dynamically link at runtime, or you can link it to, to an actual executable. All right. So uh, enough about that, but just mentioning that. So if we pretend now that our, um, since we're going to be gathering user input, maybe, like I said, the company we're working for already have a UI library or we're going to buy a UI library or we're going to code up a UI library separately to do all that abstraction that we mentioned, which is, you know, whether it's a text UI or GUI UI and all this other sort of stuff. And so again, we now going to assume that uh, we're going to call some function that's going to return that we're going to give some option or we want the GUI to be the UI to be configured. And then it's going to return to us some object. Uh, most likely a structure with a bunch of information in it. Uh, we haven't talked about structures really, but just think of it as some sort of huge data type that we could create or is provided by this library with some information. And uh, for those of you who know C or C++ or Go, you know, it's a pointer. So anyway, um, so now we can use that and give it to our user, get, get user input function, and it's going to use whatever UI we have selected or configured to then prompt the user and get the input. So that's one way in which we might be able to abstract how our application uses different UI on different systems. All right. So notice, of course, that here, if we went along with this example and I got back some sort of resource from this library, I didn't clean up. I didn't clean it up. And that's going to be one of those things that um, is going to always plague us when we do things in like C and C plus is once you allocate resources, um, you should clean it up. And C++ gave us a way with, um, you know, destructors and all destructors, but still doesn't quite um, prevent you from doing allocating resources that you you still um, leak. So 
Uh, when you write CNC process program, one of the things that you end up with is you can easily end up with memory leaks. And again, uh, we're not going to focus on that because that's not part of the the example here or, what we're, or the scope, part of the scope of what we're doing. But it's just mentioning that, hey, these are some of the problems that you run into. And we'll talk about that more when we start talking about language that come with like our garbage collectors versus language that don't have garbage collectors. All right. So now we want to do some more coding. We're thinking, well, you know what? Um, we probably want to pull out all the stuff that has to do with this UI, like um, the UI implementation into its own library. So if we imagine that we're the one implementing this, we might create a .h file. Remember I said .h file is that file that allows you to declare things. And the nice thing about that is that multiple users or even multiple places in your application, your .c file or the .h files, you can pull in this .h file that define what the structure is that you're going to use and this function, this get default UI function. So you can declare what that looks like. Sorry, not define, declare what that looks like and then now have it be pulled in by many other parts of the application. But remember, you can have multiple declarations, but only one definition. So since we need a definition, well, um, we have to um, include this .h file in our main. And of course, we have to provide the implementation of our, the definition of our function. So this we will put in a .c file. And of course, we only need this to be one place. So this is the implementation or the definition of our function to get some UI object. And then we're going to be able to pass that to our get user input um, function. OK, and then we could compile, run it, and so on, and it still works. And as before, we can compile the individual .c files, then link them all together. Those are all options. But um, And then so you can see I compiled the UI .c, main .c is separate, then link it together. And so this is showing you for the how we could have written this library and just given someone else the, either the, that up the object files or put those object files in an archive, given them to it, and that would be reusable. As again, assuming that they're on the same platform architecture, right? Or we could have, you know, put it into a shared library at uh, that SO. So we have ways of building up those things. But at the end of the day, I just want to show you how these things are reusable. I haven't shown you it being used in more than one place, but hopefully uh, you trust that since I can compile an object file and then link it to a program, I could have a, another main that C that link in the same object file on this platform and it would have also worked. All right. So Going along with the idea of, you know, we could have, or UI could be further split out to on GUI and text, and on GUI we could do Mac and Windows, and text we can do Unix and so on. Um, this is how we can even break down our module or subsystem or sub -com or component into further components and subsystems, okay? Um, so nothing new there. One of the other things you might want to do is to have a main that H that include the things that are sort of common to the application or the core of the application. And so we might create a main that H. And we might have some function that we want to implement. And so we might move out our get user input function to another that C or whatever number of files that we want to create. And of course, those files will have to pull in the .h file with the definitions that they declaration that they need. And of course, no, it just means that we have more that C files to link and run. And all this still works just fine if we can just um, compile them together and then link them. But compile and link them together. But one of the things you might want to do is, again, put those files in a directory and help with the abstraction of what we're working with. Now, if we take this, continue along this path of just creating you know, directories to abstract different parts of our application, we can create a directory for compute and storage. And um, if we then just create a few more files, so I'm going to skip forward a little bit and show you that I can create a few more files. Now, we can have something that look like this, where application, you know, is it looks pretty simple from the main file here, but there could be a lot of details hidden behind all the um, files that you know provides the detail, the, the, the definition um, for you know the create compute context and all this other stuff. I don't want you to focus on the detail. What I really want to fo you to focus on is how the main mean that C file is able to stay pretty simple and readable and all the other rest the rest of the code is hidden in the other that C and that H files and other directories and so on. And that is how you might want to structure again. Okay, this is not the only way, but this is just showing you how you can break up larger application for either code reuse or to be able to even write it and understand it in the first place. So one of the things that once you start having a large number of files is you 
you notice how we, in order to build an application, we have to compile the .c files, then link them together, um, is you might want to have a make file. A make file is just simply a file that you can put in this recipe and it allows you to um, define targets, which is what you want to accomplish, and then you can say what do tar those targets depend on. And so, for example, in this sample make file, we'll look at in a minute, um, when I try to make run make just now, the make program, which reads this make file, uh, it's telling me I had an error. So let's say I run this now. I, I comment out some of the things because I didn't implement everything or define all those things that I'm using there. It's just an ex example for illustration. As you can see, I've compiled a bunch of that O files, and then I've linked them at the end to get an executable call app. And there are some other things when I was compiling each file, I had to provide some other options to GCC compiler to tell it in which directory to look for include files and all these other things. And this leaves out a whole bunch of things that I could have done in terms of passing to the linker. And here I keep reusing GCC for compiling and for linking, but the, behind the scenes, GCC is actually calling another program to do the linking at the end, but I could have called it directly. So at the end, I'll show you how you can pass the minus V option to get a lot more details on what the compiler is actually doing. All right. So what is a make file? Well, a make file, like I said, is basically executing a recipe. It allows you to say what you want, the target, and what it depends on, and then it goes, uh, and then if you have targets that depend on other target, it derives that um, dependency and makes sure that those dependencies are fulfilled for us. So let's rename this make file to make that app, for example, and then our make demo to make file, only so we can get um, syntax highlighted. And as you can see in line three and four, it tells you that how all the make file is, is target with dependencies and then commands to be run. And there's a system command. So commands that you can call on the shell or in that whatever system you're on. So here's an example. On line five, we have a dependence, a target called high. And then there are no dependencies, but if we were to invoke that target high, the command that should be executed is echo. Now the at, I'm going to explain why there's an at in front. But and then there's, it should execute the command echo with the string. And so if we run this, um, we'll see on the command line that it's going to print out echo just as we expect. And if we do make high where we specify the target, so before the target was implied, um, whereas here we were explicit and we say we want to run the target high, we see we get the same result. And so we could tell from a make file, the default target is the first one that's defined. We're not looking to understand make files really. So. Um, get the full picture of how you do things in the CC++ world, even though you can use make file for Go also. The other thing is, so now we can say make world, make hello, and you can see specific, specifically with make hello, um, it depends on the target make world, on, on world target, sorry, the target world. So before the hello target could be considered complete, it dependency must also be complete. So of course, make runs the target world first, which prints out hello world, and then it runs the target for hello, which is thank you. And so that's why you see those two things printed out. But when if you just didn't make a world only, then that's the only thing that's printed out. Now, in terms of the at sign, if you remove the at sign, it shows you the command that's going to run. And then, of course, you get the output of the command. If you didn't, the comp command didn't provide any output, produce any output, you wouldn't get that second line. But in our case, we were running an echo command. So we don't want to see that oh, we're going to run echo plus the result of echo. So we put an at sign to silence um, showing the command that's going to be run. Let's remove everything. And here we have a simple application with just int x equals two. And no surprise, this works. But the point here is that we didn't have to include anything in order to use int. So we can say int is a built-in type, which we know int is a built-in type. If we type string there instead, it wouldn't work because string is not a built-in type. Now C defines a number of things that are part of the language, but they're in standard libraries. And so that would be like a printf. And so we can again, compile and run, and we'll get this warning about implicit declaration of a standard function. But um, still, it's part of the, every C implementation wouldn't be complete if it didn't have stand STD IO. So that's standard IO. It tells you right there, it's standard IO. It's part of the standard package, um, standard, um, like one of the standard library in the thing. And what that H is, is just these declaration that you can open and look at all the declaration of all the functions and type in studio that, oh, and we're going to take a look at that at the end of this chapter. And you'll see it's not very large at all. And then the binary part that contains the definition for those function, those were written in some .c file somewhere, compiled, linked together, and made to an object, most likely lib.c.so, somewhere on your system. And that gets linked in, um, and hence why you can use it. So the definition, 
It's only one in there that are implicit declaration because it makes some assumption about the signature of the function, which is the um, input, the arguments, and the return type. And basically, those are different than what it actually is, so it's complaining. All right. So let's say you try to use a power, the math power um, function. And so usually the POW is defined in the math.h um, header file, this declaratory, and it's, you have to usually link with the math library, which is lib, um, libm. And usually to link something with libm, when you compile and um, linking, you'd have to say like minus L and M. But notice that this worked. Um, it shouldn't have, and it didn't used to work in the older C, but newer C just automatically, I guess, the library that they linked against with, um, linked against the, by default includes the definition for, um, all the math function and so on. So normally, libc, which would include standard IO, um, the printf and so on, those you don't have to explicitly link, but you used to have to explicitly link, um, the math library, but now that's also included. You used to have to link it before, um, with the minus L and just M. And it still works, but it seems to be redundant. So one of the things you can do is you can, if you want to, browse around in your system looking for the library files. And so um, if I look on my Mac here, I could see a number of files called lib, dot x, lib, whatever, right? And so that's what I was talking about before is if a library is called, let's say, lib stdc++, and you want to, or take this one, lib ssl, um, and you want to link against it, you'd simply just do minus l ssl. And that means like, lib SSL and all the other stuff is just version information. So I'm just scrolling through the list here so you might not see all of them, but lib SSL is in there, lib standard C is in there, lib form and a whole bunch of other things. So that's how you would, if you wanted to use one of those libraries. But again, the library just represent the binary um, representation of that reusable code, which is the C code that's been compiled to object files and then linked into a library. Now, one of the other things you can do is, like I said, you can ask for all the options that are going to be used to be, for GCC to be verbose about what it's really passing to the compiler, what it's going to compile with. And if you pass minus V, you can see these are all the options that are being used. Um, quite a number of them, and feel free to look them over if you like, but um, that's not really that important unless you're doing like embedded code or something. Um, you really want to um, tighten up how efficient your code is. You might want to change some of this, but generally you don't have to do anything to tweak this. Um, the options just get more better and better over the years, and so less things you have to really specify when you compile it. Um, you can also, um, like I said, GCC calls the linker um, LD, but we don't necessarily invoke LD directly because there's just too many options to specify and libraries to link with. So you can just call GCC to say, create an executable for me, but I still want to see the option you pass the linker, and those are the options. And you could see there's minus L system, and that tells me that oh, there's a lib system that something version version that something file somewhere and it's going to link it with that and it's in one of these library directories um, so again quite a bit here but the general takeaway i want you to just walk away with is that the way c does reusable code is through these libraries whether it's shared object library or archives and object source file get compiled to object files um, the other thing is you can for your source files we're talking about that c files and header files for your like declaration. Uh, we're gonna see once we get to Java that we are doing the imports thing and and of course go also. And those are very very different than include file. But the include file you're actually pulling in the source. Um, so you pull in that declaration multiple times. Um, whereas with the other files, the import is really just telling the compiler at the time, well, okay, look over here for the thing that I want to use. And if it's defined there, this is how I want to use it. That's all it's really saying. But it doesn't really pull in anything at the time until it's ready to link, maybe. Um, so, a lot. All right, so I don't want this to be too long, so definitely follow me um, on Twitter. Um, it's Straversity1. Instagram is Straversity. And thanks for your time. See you in the next video. Uh, I'll try and post another video before I have to take off for travel. Um, okay, take care. See you. Bye.